fairly sign me. Hey! Be easy. Look here, man. We need to stop acting like this is our first rodeo. We know all the rules and regulations that govern this facility. Y'all know what I'm gonna say. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, phone a friend, y'all know what to do. Now listen to this though. They've always told you, you've heard the phrase, what do you give a man that has everything? Now in Jason's case here, he's a simple man with simple taste. And he just simply asked that the food that he eats be dead and that you give him a five-star rating. Now these are just some simple things that they're asked from you from a simple man. Can you please oblige him? And listen here, we here at The Fearless, we appreciate you, The Fearless Army, for mounting up and getting our new Fearless Army merch. You know, going over there getting that gear. Hey, go over to the men's section and take a look at our very own Jason Whitlock modeling some of our latest camo timey tidy whities Now, you may not have believed in censorship before now, but once you see this, oh, trust me, you are. Hey, listen, we got a great show planned for you today. We're going to head out to Washington, D.C. to see our guy, Delano Squires. I've come to the conclusion that Delano has everything in life Jason's money came by. Like a beautiful family, good looks, and common sense. And as the minister of intel of the Fearless Army, he's going to be coming on here and he's going to be making some comparisons to the Julius Jones case and the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. And we also got a new recruit stepping in here today. Hey, his name is Royce White. He seems to think that he's got the right stuff. He seems to think that he's got the stuff that he's and he's built to join this fearless army just because he's a former NBA player. Now, I will say that he's an anti, he's anti-China, he's anti-vax, and he actually stands behind Kyrie Irving tougher than Jason stands behind free barbecue. Now, the first guest we're going to have on today is the first female sports agent to ever sign or represent a first round draft pick from the NFL. And of course, I'm talking about Miss Kelly Masters. She's also an attorney, and I doubt if Jason knows this, but she's also a world-class baton twirler as well as, as well as being a former Miss America. She'll be out here to talk about some work that she's personally done on the Julius Jones case here in Oklahoma. Now, here's what I need to do. I need my DJ to hit that theme music. We need to release the dubs. We need to release the hounds. And we need to put our hands together for a man that still doesn't believe that fat meat's greasy. The man that gives Adele's new album two thumbs down ever since she's dating Rich Paul. So I think we all need to say it together. Hater in the house. And what's his name? Jason Whitlock. Let's do this, y'all. <clears throat> All right, great job, Uncle Jimmy. Uh, but we got to get right to it. A busy day. Uh, possibility, I think, of a Rittenhouse verdict. But we're going to uh, dive right into an interview with a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Kelly Masters. Uh, she's a pioneer in uh, the sports agency world. She's represented a lot of NFL players. Uh, but here recently, Kelly's been in the news because she has been working uh, with Julius Jones, the young man in Oklahoma that was set to be executed yesterday. And Governor Stitt in, in Oklahoma uh, commuted his sentence to life. Uh, I, I just want to disclose Kelly and her husband, Dale, I consider dear friends of mine. Uh, but and so Kelly had told me months ago that she was has been working with Julius Jones and a believer in his innocence and uh, very thrilled with yesterday's, Kelly and, and her family and team, very thrilled with yesterday's uh, commutation of, of his death sentence. Uh, and so I wanted to bring Kelly on and have Kelly uh, 
help me and help you understand why she believes Julius Jones is innocent. Uh, Kelly, welcome to Fearless. Uh, I Thank promise you, Jason. Uh, to be to be gentle, uh, <laughs> but and I really appreciate <laughs> you good. taking the time uh, <laughs> yeah. to help us understand this case. Why do you believe sure. Julius Jones is innocent? You know, when I was first presented with this case, I was skeptical, just like I think anyone else would be if they heard just some of the uh, the details uh, of the murder and uh, some of the, the facts that were presented at his trial. Uh, it's I, I was asked initially, uh, probably 18 months ago, was when I first heard of the case, I was asked to write a letter on Julius's behalf to Governor Stitt. And I knew nothing about the actual case, just kind of the bits and pieces that I had seen here and there that didn't sound good. And so I asked if I could dig into the actual file myself and read the entire transcript, uh, all of the post-conviction filings, all the appeals, the opinions, uh, all the information that did not get presented to the jury or was not considered on appeal and all the information that has come up since then. And I can say after my deep dive, uh, which took months uh, and thousands of hours uh, of reading everything, I, I truly am convinced that we, uh, we were about to execute an innocent man yesterday here in Oklahoma. Uh, one of the, the first time that I really uh, it was struck by the possibility of his innocence. I was reading the trial transcript and, and there were so many questions that were not being asked uh, of the witnesses that were being presented by the prosecution. And, and there were a lot of assumptions being made that I didn't necessarily see support for uh, in the evidence that was being presented. And so as I read the transcript, I got to the part where the prosecution rested his case and I was ready to hear the other side. And the uh, young public defenders that were representing Julius in his trial stood up when it was their turn and said the defense rests. They said nothing else. They didn't present a single witness, not a single piece of evidence. His family was ready to testify uh, as to his alibi. They were all together uh, having dinner at the time Mr. Howell was murdered. Uh, so he had an alibi that was not presented to the jury. He did not fit the description of the eyewitness. And there's been a lot of back and forth on that, but I've looked at everything that I could get my hands on and, and I've read the testimony and I've seen the pictures. And I know I'm convinced that uh, it was not Julius who was identified with, by the eyewitness, but another man, Christopher Jordan. And then the the final sort of thing for me, and there are many, many uh, questions that, that caused me to dig deeper and discover truth here. Uh, but one of the main things was Christopher Jordan, who testified against Julius, went on to admit to five different individuals that he, in fact, was the murderer and had framed his his friend Julius and that Julius was going to be executed uh, while Christopher Christopher was going to get out after 15 years. And uh, and that's very troubling. He uh, he admitted to hiding the murder weapon. Uh, in Julius's house, planting that. He actually led police to the murder weapon in Julius's house where he spent the night, the night after the murder. Uh, and there were just, you know, I'm, I've spent the time, I've also met Julius. Uh, I've, I've now you know, been working with him uh, pretty closely, but I, I asked before I made a decision to work on the case, I asked to meet him. I wanted to look him in the eye. And I am thoroughly convinced of his innocence, but even if someone can't arrive where I did, uh, after a, re a review of the case, there are so many questions that raise reasonable doubt. And, and under those circumstances, I, I am, I'm so thankful that we did not see an execution yesterday because it just wasn't supportable. Kelly, uh, I want to restate the case for perhaps people that were unaware of, you know, Julius has been in the news, but Paul Scott Howe was a businessman uh, who was shot and killed in the driveway, I believe, of his home. Yes. Uh, and I think his yes. daughters were witnesses and yeah. perhaps mistakenly, but they did identify Julius. Uh, this all happened in 1999. Mm -hmm. uh, the murder weapon and a red bandana were found in Julius's mom's home, I believe. Uh, yes. Those of you that believe Julius believe that Christopher Jordan planted that murder weapon there. Uh, but some of the troubling things for me, and I've, I've 
obviously I've talked to you about the case, but I've sure. done my own little reading up on the case and uh, I'm friends yeah. with people that are on the other side that think Julia certainly is guilty. But one of the right. most troubling things uh, is that Julius did plead guilty to a carjacking, mm -hmm. I believe, in the week prior to what happened to Mr. Howe. And mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he pled guilty to that crime after he and Christopher Jordan were arrested for the killing of, of Howe. And so right. Julius Jones isn't some just completely innocent victim that the police pulled out right. of a hat. He and mm -hmm. Christopher Jordan were on the same high school basketball team. They were friends. Yes. And Julius was involved in some pretty negative activity that I get, put him in the line of fire to be accused of such a crime. There's a lot to unpack in what you just said, and I'm, I'm so glad we're getting into this. So Julie, to, get, to paint a bit of a picture, Julius uh, in high school was a, um, they were state champions in football and basketball. He was, he was a good athlete. He, he wasn't a, an athlete that could go on to college and compete, but was a good high school athlete. Uh, he was, he graduated 11th in his class uh, at John Marshall High School. He was nominated, he was selected for president's leadership class at OU which is a huge honor. Uh, that's I was a President's Leadership Class member, and I think about 70 or 80 freshmen are chosen from the incoming thousands to be part of President's Leadership Class and be given an academic scholarship, and he was one of the selections there. So he, in a lot of respects, Julius was a, um, a very smart, very accomplished uh, kid in high school, but also a kid that admitted he made a lot of poor choices. Uh, his parents both worked, his mom was a school teacher, his dad was a, a veteran, um, that was retired. Uh, and so he was raised in a good home, but they didn't have a lot. They didn't have a lot of money. And he fell into trying to impress people uh, and, and became a, started shoplifting, started uh, stealing and selling things uh, to get money. Uh, and he was running around with, uh, with the wrong crowd, quite honestly. Christopher Jordan uh, and his friends were older, uh, but you know, bad crowd. And, and Julius talks about that to this day, that he realizes that his poor choices as a teenager and who he decided to hang around and try to impress ultimately led to the loss of his future. Um, interestingly, however, the, and a lot of, not a lot of people realize this, the only convictions uh, on Julius's record uh, at the time of, of this um, when he was uh, arrested for murder, were shop, essentially shoplifting, uh, as well as I think he had, had applied for a, a, essentially a fake ID. He tried to get a, a driver's license under another name because he was taking uh, exams for friends of his trying to make money. So he will admit he was doing some, uh, some not good things. Um, however, he was not a violent person. And, and people say, well, gosh, didn't he, didn't he commit a carjacking? Didn't he admit to that? Yes, he took a plea deal. I believe it was seven years after the fact. Um, and it was because he was not even part of that carjacking either, was not identified by a witness. When a witness later decided it was him, it was after the trial and, and he couldn't even identify uh, Julius uh, you know, just sitting in the courtroom. And so there were... Uh, he was told, Julius was told, um, after his conviction for murder, when he was appealing his death row sentence, uh, he was told that if he would plead guilty to this other carjacking charge, again, of which he wasn't part of, but Christopher Jordan was, uh, he was told if he pleaded guilty to that, to, to get a lesser charge, that that would help him as he was appealing his death sentence. Uh, and so he did plead guilty to that, although he still... Uh, maintains his innocence uh, in that regard. And you can look at that however you want to, and you can question uh, the record. I have, I've again, dug in thoroughly for myself to convince myself, and, and I've asked the hard questions. I've asked them of Julius, I've asked them of his attorneys, I've dug through uh, everything that, that I needed to know. Um, because I, quite honestly, when I came into this, I didn't have a dog in the fight, so to speak. Uh, I, I was being asked to write a letter on behalf of Julius, but I didn't represent him. Uh, I wanted to know the truth as an Oklahoman uh, and looking at everything and, and also now knowing who Julius was, who he admits he was uh, and who he is today um, to me shows me that this is not a violent man. Uh, he was a, a misguided teenager 
Uh, and, and I actually had him speak to one of my NFL players in person um, on one of my visits. And he and my the NFL player that I took with me said, man, I could have been you. I did dumb things when I was a teenager as well. And I could have easily ended up where you are. Um, and Julius recognizes that. And that's what now his message that he wants to get out is he wants to help other teenagers realize and young men, even kids at 10, 12, 13 years old, uh, that their choices matter, their decisions matter, and, and they can choose to live a better life. They don't have to to fall into the life that he did. Kelly, what's the explanation for, and maybe I'm wrong, but I thought mm -hmm. I've read that Julius was uh, spotted and or arrested while driving Mr. Howe's car, yeah. and that right. perhaps his, Julius's DNA was on the red bandana uh, and, and the yeah. weapon in his home. Uh, what's the explanation for those two things? So let's talk about the suburban first. So Julius was, uh, after the fact, much later after uh, the murder happened. The murder happened, it was a carjacking uh, at 9.30 at night. Uh, several hours later, Christopher Jordan uh, came to Julius's house to pick him up for them to run around. And Julius said he was acting very strange. He was acting very shaken. Um, and, and that night, there was no contact with Julius, and there was contact with Chris Jordan, Christopher Jordan, but not with the Suburban. The following day, however, he got a call from uh, one of the other, um, actually a, a guy that ended up being an informant, one of the, the guys that was involved, there were three that were involved in a, a car, basically a, a, a car theft ring, uh, where cars were being stolen and delivered uh, and sold. And one of those called Julius. He had met Julius. He had worked on a car of Julius's. Uh, he called Julius and was trying to find Chris. And he said, hey, I need, I need help uh, moving a car to a garage. And so Julius went over and helped him move this car. He followed uh, the other gentleman in the, who was driving the Suburban. Julius was not driving the Suburban. Uh, followed him over to a garage. Um, the garage owner, it was not really a garage, it was a car, it was a, a part of the, the, the car theft ring, uh, claimed that there, there were, that there was, quote, a body attached to the car, uh, meaning that someone had been killed. And so they left, they left the suburban there at a, a grocery store not too far away um, from that top shop. And so that was the one time that, that suddenly Julius realized, okay, these guys have done something really, really bad. I should probably go and share this information. But he was scared because he was associated with them. He wasn't, wasn't part of what happened, um, but he had been around them. And so he was concerned that he would then uh, get targeted with being part of this. The night uh, that Paul Howell was murdered, um, the, the two eyewitnesses or two witnesses that testified at trial against Julius saying that they spotted him uh, with a suburban again, one of them, and I may have misspoken earlier on the, the other carjacking, one of the witnesses who claimed that he saw Julius driving the suburban could not identify him uh, and ultimately said, well, it, it was a black man. Uh, I, you know, I can't identify him, but it was a black man that I saw driving the suburban. Uh, and then the other was the girlfriend of uh, the, the man that was involved, Liddell King, um, with the carjacking um, and with the potential, with, with the attempted sale of that car after the carjacking. It was the girlfriend of that man. Uh, and so naturally she had uh, not only the desire to protect uh, Liddell King, her boyfriend in that relationship, she was also, uh, and this is in the record, she was trying to obtain reward money um, for, for turning in any information to help with Julius's conviction. Um, so there's, there were no uninterested eyewitnesses that could have, could have pointed to him driving the Suburban that night. Uh, and again, his, his alibi checks out. Um, it just simply wasn't presented to the jury. On the red bandana, um, when I met with Governor Stitt uh, about 10 days ago with the legal team, we took a DNA expert with us, the DNA expert that had been hired uh, by the attorneys that now represent Julius, who are from the Federal Public Defender's Office. They wanted to test the, the DNA on, on the bandana. It had never been tested uh, during the trial. It was tested. Uh, and what, was, what they were able to do, they were not able to conclude uh, that it was, in fact, Julius's uh, DNA on the bandana. But what they did find was they found uh, DNA for at least four men. Uh, one of them 
had seven markers out of the 21 that matched Julius, uh, which I believe the, the benchmark is eight for the FBI. There have to be eight markers to be considered a match. So it wasn't an exact match, but it was close enough uh, to be uh, to be determined that it most likely was was Julius's DNA. The problem with it is the DNA that was found on the bandana was not what you would term crime scene DNA. It was trace DNA. So what had happened, uh, the police had spent hours digging around through Julius's home, through his room, through his clothing, through his bedding. Uh, they were finally directed by Christopher Jordan himself to, quote, look out on the roof. So they went through a, a door in Julius's room and found the, the gun and the bandana tucked inside uh, basically a door to the attic. Um, or as Christopher Jordan said, the roof, they, that's where they found the gun. Um, so the, the gun and the bandana had been stashed in Julius's room. And the people that, the investigators that had been going through his room then discovered the bandana and what was, de was able to be determined, the only conclusive uh, evidence from that, that test was that the bandana had been found in Julius's house. Uh, it could have actually been the DNA that they took could have been any of his family members, and it was considered trace DNA. So, a pe you know, a, a piece of hair, some skin cells, uh, simply from his stuff. Uh, and, and I can say, and my, my husband would say this, if you dug around in my stuff, my hair is everywhere. Um, and so, he, obviously, uh, it's possible that the DNA on the bandana um, simply came from from contact with Julius's stuff and being in Julius's house. I'll also point out there was no um, no cr actual crime scene um, evidence on the DNA on the the uh, within the DNA. It was not saliva. It was not blood. It was not a bodily fluid. Uh, those were all tested for. Those were not found on the bandana. And uh, I think it's a, a a good solid presumption to 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 think that if there was a bandana worn by a shooter in close proximity, there would be saliva on it if he was yelling, and there possibly would be traces of blood. Uh, and neither neither blood nor saliva nor any other blood, bodily fluid was found. It was simply trace evidence. Kelly, where do you and your team stand now that he no longer faces a, a death sentence? Are you still hoping or working towards trying to get the conviction overturned? So at this point, what we have is an executive order signed by Governor Stitt. The order uh, really only states that his, uh, his uh, sentence has been commuted from death row to life without a possibility of parole. Under the executive order that was signed by Stitt, there is no possibility that he could even apply for or seek uh, a pardon or parole uh, or any sort of additional commutation. Um, there are certain uh, provisions in Oklahoma's constitution um, that that still would can be interpreted as preventing Julius from seeking additional relief. Uh, however, th that is just limited to parole. Uh, under the constitution, um, you know, outside of, of what's stated in this executive order, Julius can seek uh, a pardon or an additional commutation. At least that's my understanding and, and my interpretation. So as of right now, we're bound by this executive order unless the governor decides to uh, change his mind, has a change of heart, uh, or if there's a, a successor governor that rescinds the, the current executive order. Kelly, I, I guess my number one takeaway out of all this, I, I think back uh, to my dad and how hard he was on me about the friends that I kept. Yes. And I can remember battling and arguing with him and uh, as a kid. And then I think even as an adult, some of yes. the friends I've kept. And, and uh, I, I hear your narrative on Julius just, I, I think about young kids that think they want to be in the cool crowd and they want to do what's mm -hmm. popular and we, they want that street credibility and edge. Right. Here's a guy that was a heck of a student, comes from a good family. Uh, to me, yeah. sounds like he succumbed to some peer pressure to make sure that he was street enough or had that hood mm -hmm. credibility. And right. this is clearly a worst case scenario. He, he, he was running with a group of friends that 
have no morals or integrity and certainly didn't think much of him if it's true that they basically framed him uh, for yeah. this murder of Christopher Jordan. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's unfortunate. I, I don't know what I believe, but what I do sure. know is that you're one of the best human beings I've ever had the pleasure of being friends with. I want our audience to know, I, I don't want to, uh, Kelly can define herself, but I just want to be crystal clear. Kelly is not uh, some stereotypical bleeding heart liberal who just jumps on the side of anything yeah. that's uh, against the establishment or against law enforcement. Again, right. Kelly and her husband are two of the greatest people I've ever met. I don't want, I, I don't know all of their politics, I do know they're believers. I yes. do know that uh, <laughs> oh, yes. it's hard to be as it's hard for me to think as highly as Kelly without me and Kelly agreeing on a lot of things. So I, you know, I, I don't want people to hear this and just think, oh, this is just some flaming right. liberal person who you know falls for every story in the book. The reason why I take it seriously is because I know Kelly so well. Uh, and so I appreciate you coming on and, and uh, sharing some of Julius's story and that side of the story. And I, I was very happy for you and Julius yesterday because I, it's kind of crazy. You thought it was going the other way, Kelly. You, you, I did. 24 hours earlier, you gave me bad news and then out of yeah. nowhere, I mean, <laughs> how shocked were you yesterday <laughs> when it turned your direction? I think I'm still shocked. Uh, and yesterday, we, as I was again, as I was driving to McAllister, I was on the phone with Julius, and it was uh, we were preparing him for for his death. And and I had I really not that I had given up hope, but I was looking at everything realistically, and and I uh, really believe that the the governor's mind was made up, uh, and that we were going to see him executed. And when I got the call, it was just about ten minutes before noon when the announcement uh, actually came by, by email uh, to the rest of the world, I got that call from the governor's office and they just simply said, just, you know, wanted to let you all know, um, you had, this is a private conversation that wanted to let you all know that we are commuting his sentence to life without parole. Uh, and, and I think I had <laughs> full, full transparency. I had been so emotional for the last few days. And then when I got that call, I, I didn't really tear up. I didn't, uh, I, maybe I was in shock or maybe it just confirmed something that I believed in my heart all along and that we would see him live to see another day um, and that we would continue to be able to tell his story and, and, uh, and see positive uh, come from this. Uh, and that's, that's what Julius ultimately wants. He, he admits, again, that he was, like you said, bad company corrupts good character. He was running around with the wrong crowd. He was engaging in poor behavior. Uh, he just set himself up to be framed and accused for something this heinous. Um, but thankfully, uh, thankfully, we did get that call. And, and this is today is a very different day than I was expecting it to be. And it's a different day than I expected to be as well. Kelly, I'm going to share with you now as we let you go. Uh, Cal Rittenhouse, not guilty on all counts. Uh, wow. So Appreciate uh, you joining us uh, today. And when we come back, we'll get into the Cal Rittenhouse not guilty verdicts. We'll talk with Delano Squires about it. First, let me tell you about my good friends from Good Ranchers. For better than organic chicken, see our friends at Good Ranchers. For beef that's been grass-fed and grain-finished, see our friends at Good Ranchers. To deliver a great meal for everyone in your family this holiday season, see our friends at Good Ranchers. Only through Good Ranchers can you experience the best food brought to your home from farms right here in America, 100% American, 100% of the time. Your local grocery store can't compete with the quality of food you'll get 
and our online competitors can't beat our prices. So this holiday season, you need to have Good Ranchers on your table. Go to GoodRanchers.com to buy now or subscribe today and save 20% off on each box of mouthwatering meats. Subscribing brings the cost down to less than $5 per meal. Plus, right now, get an additional $20 off and free express shipping if you go to GoodRanchers.com fearless or use the promo code fearless at checkout. That's $20 off, free express shipping at GoodRanchers.com fearless. Know where your meat comes from with Good Ranchers. Dot com. Uh, I gotta admit, I don't. I, anyway, go support Good Ranchers. They support us. They support what we believe in. They believe in America and American workers. Support Good Ranchers. Period. Because I don't want to attach Good Ranchers to my next statement. So I'm done talking about Good Ranchers. I'm very happy Cal Rittenhouse has been found not guilty. I'm sorry, it was a clear case of self-defense. Um, that young man was persecuted and justice prevailed. Delano Squires, Ertz! All right, welcome back. Uh, you guys are watching me process the Rittenhouse verdict in real time. I mean, in real time. I haven't had two hours, three hours, four hours to think about what this not guilty verdict means. Uh, and so you gotta bear with me with today's show. Uh, I'm glad we got Delano, the smartest man on the show, coming in because he can help me process what to think about this verdict. Delano wrote a column this morning uh, about Julius Jones and Kyle Rittenhouse and uh, how the criminal justice system is broken. Uh, but I think we just got a sign, Delano, perhaps, that maybe the criminal justice system isn't as broke as we thought because I certainly believe they've reached the right verdict here uh, in the Rittenhouse case. I'm shocked that, you know, after three or four days, I thought we were headed for a mistrial. I thought we were headed for a, a, a locked jury. Uh, but they shocked me. Middle of the afternoon on a Friday, Kyle Rittenhouse not guilty on all counts. Are you as surprised as I am? Hey, Jason. Um, I'm, I'm not really surprised. I mean, ever since I saw the video from Ken Kenosha last year, I always figured, you know, it was a clear case of self-defense, particularly for the, the two final people, the, the last two people that he shot. Um, the video was a little bit, you know, wasn't as clear for the first person, uh, Rosenbaum. Uh, I, I had a similar sense of you know, uncertainty in terms of which way the jury would go based on how long it took them to deliberate and just hearing different things that they would deadlock that, you know, six, six apiece um, in terms of to vote guilty or not guilty. But I always figured that ultimately the evidence um, itself would um, sort of lend itself to this particular outcome. Uh, I will say this, though, what my, my argument about um, the criminal justice system being, or our justice system being broken, is n is not so much that the laws are not there. It's it's that as a country and as a culture and, and as a society, we don't even agree on what justice is, um, and that's why, in many respects, I'm making more of a cultural argument more so than a legal argument because what we're seeing between the Julius Jones case and the Kyle Rittenhouse case is people choosing up sides based not on evidence, not on a process, not on impartiality, proportionality, but it's based on um, identity and the extent to which a particular case can further, you know, someone's political goals. I, I I'm, I'm just, a, I'm a slow thinker. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is like, I really need time to reflect. And, mm -hmm. and you know, sometimes in, in a conversation, I can be clever and quick, but on something this big, 
I, I generally, I like to sit with myself for an hour or two. I like to go sample other people's opinions and see if it sparks anything in me. And so trying to process all of this in, in real time, I, I'm sitting here in this moment mm -hmm. feeling hopeful because I think these 12 jurors did something here very courageous. I, I think that uh, the ramifications in Kenosha, we'll see tonight if there's rioting and looting and arson, but we've already seen MSNBC trying to get aggressive and or intimidate this jury pool. Uh, I would anticipate these jurors are going to be harassed and that their life uh, is going to be different moving forward, but they still manage to do the right thing. And that's why I kind of always thought it was gonna be a hung jury, a deadlock mm -hmm. jury, because I, I just thought they would pass the buck the way the prosecution passed the buck, because the prosecution could have ended all of this very early on. Look at this evidence. Look, look, look at what was going on in Kenosha the 24 hours before this. Look at what mm -hmm. was going on that night. Clearly, this young man had a reason to feel like he, he, he was in physical jeopardy, and they could have not brought charges. But that would have put the prosecution in the crosshairs. And so right. instead, they brought a case and put jurors in the crosshairs. And I, I, just, I just feel really good that there are at least 12 people, and I don't care that it took them three, four days to get there, but there are at least 12 people in Kenosha, Wisconsin, knowing the consequences of this verdict, still did the right thing. That makes me feel good about humanity. If we see this kind of courage from these 12 people, and I believe eight of them are women, I, I believe, mm -hmm. or seven of them may be women, I, I can't remember, but, but it should, men need to stand up and, and maybe the, it will inspire some courage amongst the rest of us. Mm. I think that's a good point. Um, to, to, to your other point, you're right, to your main point, what we saw is the, the system and again, we're talking about the legal system and then the court of public opinion, because those two things are, are hard to um, disentangle. But we saw it bend, but, but it didn't break. Um, it was a lot of pressure put on it from last year with then candidate, you know, Joe Biden, suggesting that Kyle Rittenhouse was part of a white supremacist militia group, absent any evidence, to even over the last couple of weeks, MSNBC and CNN really turning up the the race rhetoric dials and trying to make this a case, you know, make this case a referendum on on racial justice, um, where you know when in fact all the people that were involved are white. So I think what what we saw was those people trying to put their thumb on the scales as much as possible, but Lady Liberty um, thankfully stayed blind. And one of the things, Jason, that that I've learned over the years is to um, is to trust, even if I don't agree with the outcome, trust that the jury um, or people who are charged with investigating these matters have more knowledge based on the evidence that they're exposed to than the average person. And, and this can get really frustrating because when you have your average know-nothing celebrity on TV opining about a particular case, and you know they, they haven't read any court transcripts, they haven't looked at forensic evidence, what they do is that they glom on to the crowd. Um, and, I, and I see this again, even with the Julius Jones case, I, you hear people coming out and they're just rehashing the same talking points. Oh, the witness ID didn't hold up. Now, they're not going to go back to the documents, to the court transcripts, and, and see where the actual witness seemed to stumble a bit, but then, again, upon you know further examination and questioning, reiterated what it is that she said she saw that night. What they just hear, oh, the witness ID is, is in question, and they play the telephone game, and then by the time they say it, they'll say, oh, um, the witness recanted and said it wasn't him. And what I found over the years is that I like to go to documentation, I like to look at transcripts, and I trust that the juries have more evidence than, than the average layperson. And I think the, the first case that really opened my eyes to this was the Michael Brown case, because 
<laughs> after it happened, you know, we had hands up, don't shoot. We had his friend um, who was with him that day uh, confirming that his hands were up in a position of surrender. And that went all around the globe. And then by the time the Obama and Eric Holder Justice Department actually released their report, you saw that there weren't any witnesses um, whose testimony was credible and aligned with forensic evidence that uh, basically pointed to Darren, Officer Darren Wilson's guilt. And in fact, uh, Michael Brown's friend himself said that um, Brown had acted aggressively towards the police officer. So what, what I, again, what I find is it's easy for people to get on TV and say things because you can lie to Joy Reid or Anderson Cooper without penalty. But when you are under oath or when you're talking to the FBI, all of the, 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 the TV shenanigans have to go out the door. And that's how you got the, the one person who survived being shot by Kyle Rittenhouse, I think um, Gabe Grosenkreutz or whatever his name is. He was on, I think his attorney was on TV basically uh, contradicting his own testimony where he said, Rittenhouse did not fire at me until I pointed my gun at him. His attorney made it sound like, you know, uh, her client had her hands up when, when Rittenhouse fired. So as I said, it's easy to lie to TV personalities because there's no penalty. But once people are, are under oath or are facing penalties for lying, that's when I think it's more important to pay attention to them. So again, I, I think, you know, thankfully the, the system um, held up this time, but you, you can see how much pressure was being put on it by outside forces who have totally different they do not care about justice. As I said in my article, they care about a system of legal spoils that they can dole out to people that they agree with and withhold from people that they don't. It's funny, you mentioned Michael Brown, and you know, I've, I've, I've admitted this before, uh, but I'm not sure if I've done it on this show or if people remember or, or are aware. I, I went hook, line, and sinker on Michael Brown mm. to the point and initially, I went hook, line, and sinker on Sean King, the, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, and was selling uh, Talcum X as this, mm -hmm. you know, er, early leader to the point, uh, and I would have to go check my records back then, but I believe I sent Sean King $2,000 mm. in support of Michael Brown and his family. Uh, I think his mother was allegedly going to speak somewhere in front of the United Nations or whatever, and Sean King talked me into contributing money to that fund. And that's how early on, and again, everybody knows I'm a big Sean King critic, every, mm -hmm. but I, I bought the Michael Brown story. And I, I all the way, bought Sean King initially. And then just as I went further and further into research, and eventually I met Sean King personally, spent an afternoon with him. He was interviewing uh, for a potential job with the undefeated, and I could smell the BS. I mean, it was mm. the stench of the BS on Sean King was just so strong, I went running the other direction. And I, he, I, I'm gonna give you another one, uh, a, for I'd say for a good three years, two years, I bought the entire Trayvon Martin narrative, bought mm. it all. And there's, I watched a documentary in the past year that walked me through a lot of the BS on the Trayvon Martin case, including, I forget the name of the young woman that was the star witness. Rachel uh, John Teal. wasn't, yes, a total fabrication. She's actually the sister of some, it, Rachel, that whole narrative about her is a total fabrication. Mm. And we were lied to about Trayvon Martin. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this, I don't know if I've ever, I don't know if I've ever admitted this publicly, but there was a time when I had a good relationship with LeBron James's camp, Maverick Carter, Rich Paul, that whole group. And this is when he was down playing in Miami. And when they, uh, when the Miami Heat put on the hoodies in support of Trayvon Martin, that idea came from me. Mm. I was 
pushing Maverick Carter to have them do that. Now, again, I don't know if that's why they did it, but I do know Maverick Carter and I were having that conversation days before the Miami Heat did it. And so I don't, the naivety and just buying the media narratives, even someone as seasoned as me as a journalist, I get why people buy it. And I, I, most people don't do the uh, additional research necessary to truly understand these cases. I, I'm gonna say this, Delano, uh, before we had you on, we just interviewed uh, one of Julius Jones' attorneys. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, would, I may put you in contact with her or, or just, because she's a very good friend of mine, her and her husband. Uh, they are not leftists by any stretch of the imagination. Faith-based, solid as a rock, Christians. Mm -hmm. And she believes in Julius Jones's innocence. I don't know what I believe, but I know what I think of Kelly and her husband Dale. I know they don't, I know the kind of research and things that it would take for Kelly to get involved in something like that. Again, I haven't done all the research, but I, I, the one last thing I, I wanted, because when we were talking to Kelly, uh, I didn't get to put this in because then I, I was told about the verdict in the uh, Rittenhouse case, but, and I can't, there's a famous case in Chicago about a Chicago gangbanger that killed a woman and maybe her boyfriend. They were sitting in a park in Chicago in the 70s, 80s or whatever. This thug kills her, blah, blah. He goes to prison and gets convicted for it. Mm -hmm. While in prison, he framed another man for that murder. And one of these innocent projects in Chicago took this guy's story and helped frame this other black man for this murder. Mm. And they sprung, they used it. This guy's been sitting in prison for years. He frames another man while he's in prison for this murder, for that murder, an innocence project and a group of well-intentioned white liberals get involved and get this man that was framed, convicted of the murder, and get this gangbanger sprung from prison. It's one, mm -hmm. and so it's incredible what can happen with these innocent projects and just these narratives that can get spun using the media. I'm telling people need to, and hopefully before this show's over, I'm gonna look up the guy's name and tell you the story, tell you the documentary. You can watch it for yourself. But, but these media narratives and the way they get spun out and who's in control and what the real agenda is, because mm -hmm. again, th these people that ended up framing the guy for the murder in Chicago, their agenda is to end the death penalty. Right. And so you, they can have a good agenda. You know, a lot of people, a lot of Christians may agree with that agenda, but the way they go about it, sacrificing <laughs> another man, to let a guilty man out so they can have a narrative of, oh, look, the criminal justice system, look how corrupt it is. And, and mm -hmm. I, I didn't get into this with, with Kelly, but uh, all the way, because I, I didn't go all the way, but you know, part of the Julius Jones thing that, that I, I don't buy is like, that the investigation was tainted by racism because one of the cops allegedly showed up on the arrest of Julius Jones and called him the N-word. And, and I know that's supposed to be the end-all be-all unless you're uh, Joseph Rosenbaum, you can use the N-word because you're on the right side of, but, 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 but I'm just sitting there as a cop, black or white, mm -hmm. if I show up and, and, and I believe you have murdered a man in his driveway in front of his children, I really don't care what name they call him. I, I really don't. And, and I'm sorry uh, for, for saying that and perhaps offending some people. Uh, but anyway, I, I just, 
I, I'm just trying to think this through. I, I do want to yeah. give you an opportunity because I thought your column was great. The Rittenhouse verdict has, you know, kind of overshadowed everything. But are there more points you wanted to make about your column today that we, we haven't gotten to? Yeah, I, w- I want to couple, make a couple points, all right? I think there are plenty of reasons for um, well-intentioned people to have questions about or object to the death penalty. Some of those, um, you know, are moral, religious, ethical, administrative. Some people think it's not the government's job to execute people. Some people think the government is too incompetent to ensure that innocent people don't get executed. Some people think about, you know, racial inequities. So there's all different reasons for people to not um, be pro death penalty. And I'm a person that believes that part of what justice demands is that the innocent go free and that the guilty are punished. So if Julius Jones is is factually innocent, not that not whether he could be found not guilty by a jury based on reasonable doubt. I'm talking about he, he was not there. He did not participate in any way, shape or form in this crime. Then he should go free. So I, I want to make that clear. But part of what I want to, to talk about in my column is the, the tendency for the left to find more sympathy with criminals, even people who are convicted criminals, right? People who, they, 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 there's not even a question of whether they're innocent or not, than with victims. So that's why I referenced Stanley Tookie Williams, the, the co-founder of the Crips, who this was well over a decade ago, when he was coming up on his death sentence, you had celebrities from Snoop Dogg and Jamie Foxx to all different other people trying to um, uh, petition Governor Schwarzenegger at the time, who was governor of California, to commute his death sentence. And that just goes to show you where their priorities lie, right? They would much rather put their moral force behind trying to get the co-founder of the Crips spared the death penalty than putting any attention on the thousands of people who are, uh, you know, whose family members are killed each year and half of those people being black folks. So th- that's that's part of my issue. And, and to me, um, justice, as I said, demands that the, 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 the innocent go free and the guilty are punished. On the flip side, when the guilty are not punished and when they're celebrated, that also has an effect. It creates perverse incentives in, in a society because now we're to the point whether it's in the mainstream sort of culture, whether it's in, you know, quote unquote, black culture, particularly in hip hop culture, where any garden variety rapper who's up on charges, serious criminal charges, free this person, free Yayo, free uh, Pimp C, whoever it is. And nobody ever asks, okay, so what did this person do to get, to get arrested? And to what extent should we have any sympathy for, for the victim and their family members? And you see that playing out time after time after time in our crim- in, in both our, you know, sort of the conversations around criminal justice and how we, you know, look at culture. And you you hit the nail on the head. These people are against the death penalty, but they're very specific on the on the the cases that they take up, right? Because if they were principled, and and in this case, I'm going to name one name who I've often criticized, but in this case, I'm going to give him credit, which is Mark Lamont Hill who is a principal death penalty abolitionist who has said publicly, I don't believe Dylan Roof should be executed. Now, none of the people we're talking about, Kim Kardashian is not going to make that argument on CNN. Van Jones is not going to make that argument on CNN, right? They're very selective in who, who they want to target because this is about a broader agenda, agenda to destroy, dismantle all of the, the things that they think make America a, a racist, patriarchal, sexist, uh, you know, sort of uh, oppressive place for, for marginalized groups. And, and the last thing I'll say is this, as I said, you can tell a lot about a person based on who they defend and who they attack. And for me, the way the left throws around the term justice is extremely telling. And that's why I end my article by talking about when you see how they defend, again, t- like convicted criminals, Julius Jones aside, again, I go to Stanley Tookie Williams, I can go to a number of, of other people whose cases they've taken up. So for, for them, they will, for instance, on the issue of abortion, use reproductive justice as a euphemism to, 
to say that unwanted children should be killed in the womb. But criminal justice is how they characterize trying to spare the most vicious rapists and murderers from death. And, and to me, that says a lot about people. When, when they think that the ultimate innocence, right? No one more innocent than a child because you know a, a baby doesn't ask to be born. If that baby is not wanted, the left thinks that that human being, that image bearer is more worthy of death than the very rapists that they always bring up when abortion comes up. They always talk about rape and incest. But for them, if, if a rape actually did produce a pregnancy, they want the child to die and the rapist to live. And that's why I ended my article by saying, that is not a standard of justice that I'm familiar with in any ethical, religious, or moral tradition. Great job, Delano. Uh, we're gonna keep Thank it you, moving. Jason. Thank you. Uh, we had a you know call a little bit of an audible, but I knew you could handle that. All right, uh, we're gonna bring in a, another scheduled guest, Royce White, the former uh, NBA player. If you remember, he had to basically step away from basketball because of some mental health issues. Royce, uh, we had a longer interview plan where we're gonna unpack a lot from COVID to his issues with uh, NBA players and their position on China. But now we're gonna talk some Kyle Rittenhouse uh, with, with Royce and his credibility on this topic will be interesting. He's someone that uh, led some George Floyd protests. So it'll be interesting what he thinks about this uh, Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. Uh, stay tuned for that. Go to youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock Hit those likes, hit that subscribe. Give me some five-star reviews on my podcast. Get in the comments. Royce White. Urgh. All right, welcome back. Uh, look, the Rittenhouse trial has kind of taken us off in, a, or the Rittenhouse verdict has taken us in a different direction than what we planned. We had scheduled to interview uh, Royce White here, former Iowa State basketball star, kind of like the second iteration of Marcus Pfizer from Iowa State. I covered uh, Marcus Pfizer in the or Big 12 when I was working in Kansas City, and Royce White kind of with better ball handling skills. But anyway, Royce was a first round NBA draft pick, 16th pick, I believe, overall in the draft. Many of you may remember he had the anxiety issues and didn't play his first year in the NBA and, and ended up not really playing in the NBA at all uh, because of his anxiety disorder and how it was handled in professional basketball. Royce has uh, become an activist. Uh, he's led some of the protests uh, related to George Floyd. He has thoughts about China and NBA players, the Uyghurs, and just for Enos Cantor and all that. And so what I think we're going to do is unpack Royce's bigger narrative and story next week because I was asking Royce before we brought him on, I was like, hey, man, you got any thoughts on Kyle Rittenhouse? And he's like, yeah, I got some thoughts on Kyle Rittenhouse. And so we're going to unpack that today. And this is kind of just a preview to let our audience know Royce is a very thoughtful person. You may not agree with everything that he says, but there's no disputing the fact the guy's got some intellect. He's a thoughtful person. He's given all of his opinions a, a, a lot of thought. And so uh, I can't wait to hear what uh, Royce has to say about the Cal Rittenhouse not guilty verdict. We may talk a little George Floyd. Uh, but anyway, Royce White, welcome to Fearless. Uh, glad to have you, and, and we'll just jump right into it. Not guilty on all counts for Kyle Rittenhouse. What does Royce White think about that? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think it was the right verdict. You know, I'll just say that. Um, and, and first to go back and, and tease out just a moment of, of what your intro was there, um, you know, my career and, and this this correlates to, to what we're going to talk about here, I think, a great deal. I think a lot of these issues uh, are connected in, in many ways. Um, you know, my career never worked out and I never played because the neoliberal machine 
is categorically afraid of intellectually competent black men such as myself and the mental health conversation or debate between me and the NBA was just a proxy. Um, and I think the Kyle Rittenhouse case is a proxy in a, in a similar social dynamic. Um, you know, I, I led the biggest George Floyd protest here in Minneapolis, and we actually marched on behalf of Jacob Blake. Uh, the reason why is because, yes, the state has a monopoly on violence. And, and this is where I think people have to start. The state has a monopoly on violence, and, and too often it renders unacceptable outcomes, such as the death of George Floyd or the shooting of Jacob Blake. But the monopoly extends well beyond the order of violence. Okay? The state and the corporatocracy have conspired to monopolize the American dream, and they've uh, put a tag on it that reads Made in China. And in that, they've tried to play this, this three-card Monty game of color and race you know, between black and white while they make off with the green. Um, and, and that's exactly what we've seen here in this Kyle Rittenhouse uh, trial. This is what you see in the prosecution of Steve Bannon, uh, the continued um, propaganda around Donald Trump and, and many of the other social issues that we face in our society. And I come from the mental health field or the mental health background or mental health advocacy. So I think I have a much broader scope on these issues and people's intentions and their their desire to play fundamental power games with these social issues. Royce, you just said a mouthful. I want to unpack these things, try to <laughs> one at a time. You're getting what you call for, Jason. You call me, that's what you I, get. <laughs> no, you said a mouthful. Let, I, I've taken some notes here. You say, I, I just want to start here, this is just the start, but you say the neoliberal machine afraid of Royce White, and that's why, and strong black men, articulate, intelligent black men. Unpack that a little bit more as it relates to Royce White and the situation that you face trying to play in the NBA. Well, yeah, I'll give you the short and condensed version. I'm sure we'll get more into it next week, but if I take you back, um, I was one of the first athletes to talk about to, to talk publicly about living with anxiety disorder. Um, and I was certainly the first athlete or the first basketball player to do so ahead of being drafted coming out of Iowa State. Um, and so because of that, you know, my story or the, the story of my anxiety was a, was a central story in the draft that year. Um, and, you know, I was still drafted anyway, obviously 16th. Um, but afterward, it was a foregone conclusion that I had that my where I had been drafted was affected by uh, my anxiety or let, for lack of a better uh, phrase, the NBA's uncertainty or unfamiliarity with mental health. Now, upon my arrival in the NBA, I discovered that there wasn't a single mention of mental health in our entire collective bargaining agreement, uh, which I went and read line by line, and, and most players don't do that. And, and that's why I'm, I'm referencing this in your uh, question about intellectually competent black men. It was in my own reading of my collective bargain agreement that I discovered there was no mental health policy. So I advocated that we create one um, for two reasons. One, um, it's fundamentally dangerous for general managers and team owners to have unilateral authority on issues such as mental health for the players. Number one, because they're not qualified to, to do a good job in, in handling those issues or having that kind of authority. But number two, uh, there's a clear conflict of interest. And it's a conflict of interest that we see as a microcosm between business and health across a litany of issues, right? So um, I advocated that we create a mental health policy. We heard every excuse in the book from the collective bargaining agreement can't be changed all the way to players may uh, fake mental illness uh, and, and try and still be paid if we, if we implement mental health policies or the policies we were suggesting. And then ultimately, uh, you know, I was blackballed for the, from the league for being right, but I was also blackballed because all of the medical people who were involved in that conversation, even the ones on the league side, agreed that a policy was necessary, and they agreed that one was possible and uh, could all, could be done and implemented without the 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 huge threat of any like malingering or, or faking of mental illness from players. Right? It may happen, but but. The medical people that were involved or experts that were involved were pretty confident we could create a policy that, that would circumvent any of that. Um, and, and they resented me for that. They resented me because I was right. They resented me for a number of reasons. But they also resented me because the mental health topic is the greatest social issue we face. 
Okay, and and there is an epidemic of mental illness that is starting to take hold in our society, and and <clears throat> not only did their industry, the entertainment industry, and and a lot of this neoliberal elitist um, modern society want to have the freedom to be predatory around the human psychology with the emergence and proliferation of social media and big tech. Um, but they also know that I knew that the mental health conversation is, is much bigger than the scope that most people discuss it in, which is, you know, mental illness, anxiety or depression or PTSD or, you know, all of those clinical diagnoses. But in our conversations behind closed doors, I told the NBA, as I've tried to advocate for a while now, that, that mental health is better described as the human condition and the, the place where mind, body and spirit converge into the perceivable existence. So I, I take you through all of that to say me being able to articulate that and bring those issues full circle is exactly what the neoliberal machine is afraid of. And that's exactly why many of your listeners probably have a completely different picture of who I am based on headlines that were all, you know, written and, and promoted by by the liberal machine, the mainstream media liberal machine. Royce. I want to get us to talking about your position on George Floyd and Jacob Blake and Cal Rittenhouse, but you're saying so many interesting things that that I don't want you to, because we'll get into this next week, but but I am fascinated by, if you had, and this is a selfish desire from me, so I'm acknowledging Mm -hmm. this up front, but if you had just come in and played in the NBA, put, and again, what I'm about to say is very selfish on my part and it's probably irresponsible to say, but I'm just gonna say it. If you had put your anxiety or disorder on the back burner and just played in the NBA and developed as an NBA star, it puts you in position to really have a massive platform and confront these things that you're talking about and really be a voice, a credible voice, standing up for the players and for athletes in this point of view. No, yes you, and, you disagree? Yes and no. I mean, I hear what you're saying, right? And, 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 I, and I feel what you're saying, and I appreciate that you are, are, are basically saying that I would have been able to become a, a pretty good basketball player and had a bigger platform, but here's the issue with, with the premise. The issue with the premise is number one, spiritually, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And the, the heresy against that spiritual, um, that, that, that spirituality, that, that doctrine is, is why America and the, the modern society is where it is today. But just in, in your example or scenario, let's say I did play. Let's say that I did not talk about the significance of the mental health crisis or epidemic or that I didn't sound that alarm. There is no level of success underneath elitists who have authoritarian um, designs where truth tellers get to tell unadulterated truths. This is why LeBron James is still silent about the Uyghurs and he's as powerful and as successful and as productive as a basketball player as we could possibly imagine. There isn't a there isn't a better basketball player, arguably, in the history of humanity. Certainly isn't a more powerful one or one with a bigger platform than LeBron James. But he can't talk about the Uyghurs. So why would I assume that me being successful uh, would allow me to talk about mental health when the time came? You'll never be allowed to talk about the things that matter the most underneath a system that doesn't want you to, no matter how successful you become. And, And that's the pipe dream and the delusion of grandeur that many of us have about uh, elitism because we've been conditioned in this culture of elitism but but becoming elite underneath authoritarians doesn't doesn't make you safe and we see that with the the you know probable kidnapping of 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 the chinese tennis star there in china for speaking out against government officials now she may end up you know being found and, and maybe she's um, unharmed but certainly china has a, a history of, of of snatch and grab of political dissidents and, and we, we covet that authority here in America and in the West, right? We have democracies and we have constitutions, so we're a little bit, you know, we have the thin veil of democracy to cover it up and smooth it over. But, but we cover, covet the authority of Xi Jinping and, and we like that authority. And, and we have designs to move in that direction here in America. So five years from now, when the CCP in China has fully taken root 
and the minds and the hearts and the fundamental supply chains of our society. Is that when Royce White was going to be able to come out and say mental health was the greatest social issue we face and policy needed to be directed toward it? No. No, I'm going on the fiery line first when they take over, and so are you, Jason. So, <laughs> oh, I, I definitely know that. Uh, yeah. So, now help me understand your position on George Floyd, because I see George Floyd as part of that process, this racial justice smokescreen of, you know, let's, let's point everybody at, at race, and let's miss the bigger picture. And, and let me add this, Royce, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I have a cousin, Anton Butler, who I helped raise. He was killed by police in Indianapolis in 2012. So I don't come at these issues. I paid for the funeral, I helped raise him, my family went through that experience. I don't come at the George Floyd or any of these issues f without any empathy at all. But I, I see George Floyd as a tool being used to sow seeds so that, so that we can demonize America and argue what we need to do is be more like China. I, I, I see George Floyd, I see Jacob Blake, I see all of that, that's, that's cut from the same cloth, that's all part of the same strategy. And you're 100% right. <laughs> I mean, I'll just come out and say it. You're 100 percent right. But we have to we have to be able to utilize the nuances of these social dynamics enough to understand that while George Floyd may be, in fact, uh, used as a three card Monty for a neoliberal agenda, a globalist authoritarian neoliberal agenda, his death was still unjust and his death uh, in fact, was a byproduct of the same underlying authoritarian, reckless monopoly on violence that will come twofold for all of us when the neoliberal agenda does take over. So uh, whether people see it or not, just because a neoliberal machine or neoliberals go out and protest on behalf of George Floyd, that doesn't mean that their authority in the future wouldn't see the same outcome for George Floyd. And that's why black male leaders like myself who went to the front lines had a huge conflict and, and friction with the, um, you know, let's say, uh, feminist LGBTQ uh, sellout black men coalition. Because we understand that the fight is about sovereignty. And if we don't have sovereignty, then the authoritarian rule and the death of the citizen will see more people end up like George Floyd. Um, and, and there's definitely a disconnect on the ground between people gr on the grassroots level who are interested or believe that black lives matter, let's say, and the black lives organization from a political strategy position. So I agree with you that George Floyd and, and Jacob Blake and all of them have been advantageously used by the neoliberal machine to undermine America. But but there is a rightful criticism of America that should happen. And, and when people talk about America, sometimes we get confused in talking about America as the idea or America as the current political situation. And in our current political situation, there's two Americas. And there's always been multiple Americas, you could say, but right now there's a clear divide in America. So, um, you know, there is a rightful criticism to happen about America and, and George Floyd should rightfully be at the center of it. What is the scope of authority and, and violence um, um, that is rightful or just on behalf of the state? Um, and and, and that, that's a good question. And it's one that people should continue to ask and push back on uh, when, when situations like George Floyd or Jacob Blake happen. However, the canary in the coal mine with all of it, as you've alluded to, is that there is a profound level of neoliberal racism that uh, supersedes any level of, of right wing white supremacy that that they try and decry. Uh, now, you really just hammered my point there in, in, ter <laughs> in terms of liberal racism is yeah. one of the greatest scourges. I, I, th this convincing Jason, of young here, black people. Here, here's what I faced when I went out and led the protest about George Floyd. We didn't go to the first precinct in Minneapolis. We went to the Federal Reserve because we wanted to know where our $30 trillion went, right? Where's the $30 trillion of national debt that have been run up 
over the last 12 years and, and siphoned off by our elites and paid for the, the rise of the Chinese empire. That's what we wanted to answers to. And we understood that the pipe dream of authoritarianism is how the negligence has festered and allowed police departments to become a byproduct that are underfunded. <laughs> they wanted to defund the police. I'm sitting there going, where'd the $30 trillion go? It didn't go to our hospitals. It didn't go to our roads. It didn't go to our airports. It didn't go to our schools. It didn't go to our police departments, right? It went to Afghanistan. Six trillion of it on record went to Afghanistan, but it went to a bunch of other uh, elitist and uh, globalist agendas. So, you know, we faced neoliberal white women neoliberal white women who wanted to empower and create this unholy alliance with grieving black women, with afraid black women, where the new, the new hard line for revolution is about uh, sexual identity and, and, and sexual preference. And as a black male leader, I, I went to the front lines and I said, those things can never be the, the foundations of revolution. Uh, because the, the claim is that the state has a fundamental monopoly on violence and they're willing to transgress that monopoly. So we're talking about a violent dynamic. Okay, so, so symbolic revolution isn't an option, right? And they don't wanna hear that. And the reason is they don't wanna revolt. The neoliberal machine does not wanna revolt. They don't want justice. They don't want freedom. They don't want democracy. What they want is people in charge who share their ideological beliefs and black men are not included because part of their ideological beliefs are that all men are bad. And that's, that's what we're seeing in the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Brother, you just knocked it out of the park. That's uh, why I'm not <laughs> the That's why what? That's why I'm not in the NBA. <laughs> you just knocked it out of the park because the Cal Rittenhouse thing, and I, we've been talking about it all week, but it's like man's instincts, man's role is to be a protector. It, yeah. It's in his nature. And so this 17 year old boy looking at his father lives in Kenosha. He had a job in Kenosha. I think he had grandparents in Kenosha. He's looking at his city being vandalized and uh, looted and arsoned and all of that. And, and he's like, well, I'm gonna go here and try to do my part to protect it. And the liberal machine does not want men trying to protect anything. They want us to st stand down and act like we all have vaginas. And I, 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 that's why I'm just sorry that I don't care who does or doesn't like it, but that's why I was rooting for this not guilty verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial because a not guilty verdict says is a signal. I don't know how many people will hear, but like, no, nah, man, you, you can still be men. You can still have balls. You can still protect family, property, whatever. Uh, you can still give in to your natural instincts. Well, you know, the, and the, the bigger play, it, well, f first and foremost, there is a crisis of, of femininity uh, in, in our society, I think. And part of it has to do with the proliferation of this neo-feminist movement that is not well rooted in, in logic and, and reason. And, and I think that it's, it's manipulative at its core. And there are plenty of women out there in our, in our country and around the world who, who completely uh, are, are against, the, you know, against that movement. Um, however, there are a bunch of men in our society in places of power who have capitulated to that movement because they see it as a tool. And in that way, the neo-feminist movement has been utilized the same way black people's plight has been utilized as a sort of buffer and defense mechanism or shield for the real globalist agendas. Because he here's the scenario. If, if you believe that there, if you can't come up with a scenario in your mind, hypothetically, that would warrant your participation in a hostile revolt or in a violent defense of, of your citizenship, your freedom or your community, then the authoritarians have free range to do whatever they want.
right? And th and that's what they want. They want to surrender by proxy. They want to they want a tacit surrender. They want a cultural surrender, a, a preemptive social surrender. And that's the that that's what people like myself and and the rest of the uh, emerging populist movement won't stand for in this country. Is you know, do I see the problems with with firearms? Of course, I'm a mental health advocate. I know we're all we're all. Uh, a day or two or situation away from being psychologically unstable. But I don't have any, un I have no um, false notions about the psychological stability of the state and the people that sit in positions of power there either and, and the danger of that. Um, and and the, the Second Amendment is the only thing keeping this country from becoming China. But people don't understand that, it, 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 two things. Some people don't understand that because they don't know what's going on in China. And the other half would invite America to become China. They would love that. Elaborate a little further because, and I got to be honest with you, I don't own a gun. For a long time, I was anti-gun. I'm now not anti-gun. I think a lot of... Uh, black people because we have bought into the myth that being black is being a Democrat or being a liberal. We don't understand the Second Amendment and how it actually works for us. Uh, and so could you please unpack that, explain that to, so that I can send it out over social media and I can just, anyway, un unpack why the Second Amendment actually works for us, not against us? Well, I, look, you know, in my letter to the NBA, which I published about five years ago now and, and turned into a book entitled Long Past Overdue, I say that in the final analysis, um, we are in such a place psychologically as a society that guns do create, uh, you know, create a very real threat and danger. Um, because like I just said, people's psychological stability is, is so in flux and their moral foundations um, are, are so um, weakened by where society has become that we're all psychologically vulnerable uh, just to the, the ebbs and flows of, of everyday life as, as American citizens in, in, in the West um, or anywhere in the world. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy new world out there. Um, however, People don't understand the fundamental math around governmental control, okay? We only have so many troops. We only have so many police officers or law enforcement of, of whatever variation. And the fact that everyday American citizens are able to own firearms is exactly why they can't go door to door and force you to be vaccinated. Right. It, it, it's it's it wouldn't be safe for them to do that. And many of the police officers or law enforcement in this country, they know how many guns are in America. Right. There's five guns for every person. Right. So and that's also why a, a foreign power would have trouble coming and invading America on American soil. They may attack us, but to actually come and occupy the ground here in America would be tough to do because every few blocks they'd be facing random gunfire. People think that the insurgency in Afghanistan is an issue. Um, let, let a foreign power try and invade America and go door to door, street to street. They're gonna face a volley of gunfire every few, few blocks. Um, that'd be black communities, white communities, Latino communities, it doesn't matter. So, you know, there is a fundamental mechanism that the Second Amendment does protect our freedom. Um, but again, a lot of people have lost their individual constitution individually. I'm not talking about the United States Constitution. They have no constitution and no sense of self and no sense of freedom or, or individual power or, or individual confidence. It's all it's all this. This whole movement is this promulgation of self-doubt um, and, and, you know, cowardice. Right. And so many of them, many of those kinds of people will opt for the authoritarian authoritarianism. They crave tyranny. And that's what we're seeing in this country. All these anti Second Amendment, you know, folks, they're not doing it because guns are dangerous. They're doing it because they crave tyranny. They want to be decided for. Like Dr. Cornell West said, uh, people people love, uh, you know, relinquishing control and, and having someone make decisions for them. You know, Malcolm, this is how you can tell that the neoliberal movement is way off the rails and, and corrupted in its, in, its, in its spirit. 
None of them want to. Uh, none of them want to prop up Malcolm X. None of them want to prop up Fred Hampton. Right. They, they don't want to talk about Malcolm X and the rifle clubs or, or the Black Panthers bearing arms and open carrying uh, on the White House steps. They don't even want to acknowledge that. They just tacitly approve of Fred Hampton and Malcolm X, you know, in, in passing. But they don't want to implement any of their real thoughts and beliefs about how to, uh, you know, protect freedom in this country. They would rather opt for the Margaret Sangers and the and the Gloria Steinem's. Right. And, and I'm just completely against it. The, this entire white neoliberal women's movement is disgusting to me. It's racist. And you're not going to convince me that Donald Trump, Steve Bannon or Kyle Rittenhouse are any more of a threat to black people in this country than your local Planned Parenthood. You're just not going to do it because I know what America would look like if we had another 30 to 40 million black people. And Joe Biden knows it. That's why Joe Biden told the Congressional Black Caucus that you guys need to go talk with the Latinos because in a few years, they're gonna have a bigger population than you. Well, if black people's grievance in this country is all about our population size because of a political game and votes, then we should be anti-abortion and we should be anti-open borders from a practical standpoint. But many of these black folks aren't even interested in black America seeing any type of change. The whole protest for George Floyd and Jacob Blake isn't about a fundamental change in America for black people, because if it was, they would go to the economic side, because that's where the real change happens. That's where the power lies, and they know it. The police departments are pawns for the corporatocracy, and they all know it. Royce, uh, I'm almost ready to start speaking in tongues. I believe I've caught the Holy Ghost. Uh, my God, man, you just said so much right there. Lord, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm joking about speaking in tongues, but you damn near brought a tear to my eye. To hear a young man talk this articulately, this strongly, to understand these issues the way that you do, it just gives me hope. Uh, I, I, I can't wait to unpack you more next week. I gotta keep it moving, but my God, you just said a mouthful. I hope people hear it. I can't wait to talk to you again next week. Uh, young brother, keep, uh, keep hope alive, stay safe. Uh, thank you for this time and uh, wanna talk to you again next week. All right, go to youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Did y'all just hear Royce White? I'm not I'm ho I'm fighting back tears right now because I don't want to get clowned the way I clowned Randy Moss for crying. But what this brother just said makes me want to cry because it's like I didn't even know that these young guys existed. Could you imagine if if LeBron James had Royce Weiss? balls and intellect. That was good stuff. Uh, all right, we're gonna bring Uncle Jimmy out here for a review of the show. Uh, I was, are we gonna, do I still wanna do the approval rating on uh, Antonio Brown? He's been caught with a fake. I, I don't know if I can. So I don't, the Rittenhouse thing is, is throw, how much time do I got left? Eh, I could bring in my guy Dave Shannon. We'll bring in Uncle Jimmy. It's my obligation to hate discrimination, raising up your hands for freedom. All right, welcome back. I'm still processing uh, the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. Uh, my number one takeaway is, is probably where I ended with, with uh, Royce there in terms of men and our natural instincts to be protectors. And we've heard a lot of discussion over the past couple of weeks about, uh, well, I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have, why did he go over there? He should have stayed home. And a lot of second guessing of Kyle Rittenhouse and his behavior. And, and I just want you to sit back and ask yourself, if your community where your 
father lived, where you hold a job, where your grandparents live, was being looted and burned. And there, there's all kinds of violent activities, again, that the corporate media has not shown you in terms of what was really going on in Kenosha in the aftermath of the Jacob Blake shooting. There's video of horrendous attacks on citizens there in Kenosha. Tucker Carlson showed a video, dozen people stomping and beating uh, a white business owner that was trying to protect his business. And he was surrounded by a swarm of mostly peaceful protesters who kicked and stomped this man into the ground. It looked a lot like Reginald Denny getting pulled out of his truck uh, after the Rodney King verdict. But the, the media won't put that in your face and give you an accurate picture of what was going on. And so this young boy, the night before, not the night of the shooting, but the night before, went to Kenosha, it's my understanding. His mother didn't drive him there, the, the lies, and he crossed the state line with a gun. It's not true, the gun was already over in Kenosha, but he, he signed up and wanted to protect his community and provide medical help to people who were being brutalized. It's all on tape. And we want to sit around and, and second guess Kyle Rittenhouse. What's he doing there? Well, he should have stayed at home, blah, blah. And, and, and some of that I can almost understand if it were consistent. If we're going to second guess Kyle Rittenhouse's behavior, why was he there? Don't get upset when people say, why did George Floyd resist arrest for 30 straight minutes? Why did George Floyd try to pass off uh, counterfeit bills? Why did George Floyd fill himself up with fentanyl? Again, because if you're going to criticize and second guess Kyle Rittenhouse, you need to be open to people second guessing and criticizing your favorite victim or martyr. And so, again, there are people, just like people will say, oh, I could never see myself doing what uh, Kyle Rittenhouse did. There's a lot of people. <laughs> I could never see myself doing what George Floyd did. I'd never be in that position. I'd never be hyped up on fentanyl. I'd never be passing off counterfeit $20 bills. And I certainly wouldn't be arguing with the police for 20 or 30 minutes and resisting arrest and talking about I'm claustrophobic and I can't get in the back seat of the car. And but I wouldn't have done any of that. And I've been pulled over by police many times. I wouldn't have done any of that. And so there's, my problem with many people is there's no consistency of logic. It's just, hey, this is what's trending over Twitter. This is what they're saying over Instagram. This is what I'm supposed to believe because of my skin color and I wanna fit in and I don't wanna be a sellout or I don't wanna be accused of being racist. I, I just want personally to protect this country, protect the freedoms that we have in this country. Those freedoms have served me and my family well, and we were not born with a silver spoon in our mouth. And so Cal Rittenhouse's instincts to protect his community and that was his community, because again, where he lived in Illinois was a 20 minute drive from Kenosha. His mom lived in Illinois, his dad lived in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It's his community, his instincts to protect himself and his community, no different than my father's. My father carried a 38 revolver every day that I knew him. 
because his instincts was to protect himself, his business, his property. My father pulled that gun several times, protecting his business and himself. He didn't pull it on the police. He pulled it on mostly peaceful criminals. So I, I just, to me, this is a good day for men with balls. If you don't have any, it's probably a bad day. If you want to see the rise of the matriarchy, it's probably a bad day for you. If you are someone who hears someone banging at the door in the middle of the night, and you think it's criminals trying to break in and rob you, if you're the type of person who would get out of bed and bring your woman with you to go see who's at the door, it's probably a bad day because you ain't got balls. You're not really a man. You're a coward who doesn't want the responsibility of being a man. You want to run to the media. <laughs> what a tragedy. Brianna was shot because I wasn't man enough to tell her, baby, you stay back here. I'm going to go see who's at the door. See, when your stupidity of firing that first shot with your woman standing in the room with you, your stupidity cost her her life and escalated a situation. If you're one of those type men, it's a bad day for you. You don't think logically, you think emotionally. You're a coward. Bad day. Good day for me, though. I got no problem with Kyle Rittenhouse. Glad he's free. Glad that they're these 12 courageous jurors that rejected the nonsense put on by the prosecution. Uh, so anyway, those are my initial thoughts, having had whatever it was, the past hour to process uh, what we just uh, heard and learned about uh, Cal Rittenhouse. I'll have more to say on this, I'm sure. Uh, Uncle Jimmy is here. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, today's show? Mm. Fact field. Fat field. Fat or fact? It's your show. Fat field. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. No, man, I love the show, honestly. Uh, I love Delano, D Delano, man, he said, uh, we don't know what justice is. No, we don't. I, I agree mean, with that. Hey, man, and, and, and that sounds so simplistic, but he said, we don't know what justice is. You know, and he said something that really hit on the way I feel right now. And he said that, uh, and this is what I wish Americans would do. Hey, man, just trust in the legal process. You know, just trust in the process that America has set forth. Not how you feel, what you think should be done. Hey, man, we got a process, and I believe in the process. Okay. It, it, I agree with you, but there are people definitely trying to corrupt the process. I think this jury rightfully felt intimidated and felt like, whoo, it's going to take a big pair to reach this not guilty verdict because we're going to be under attack. Wouldn't you feel intimidated? Yes. But Wouldn't I you feel intimidated with, with what MSNBC was doing? Had no. Joey Reid chasing the bus all through town? <laughs> That wouldn't intimidate you? Racial matter, as I like to call her, but anyway. Also, let me ask you this, man, because something came out, and I, I think only Delano brought this out of you, and I don't think you realize this. You do realize that during your conversation with Delano that you admitted that you were the one that put the Miami Heat, you're the one that put them in the hoodies. So you're the one that told that turned LeBron into an advocate. He didn't know nothing about it until you did it. I, 
I, I said that I certainly was having that conversation, and, and at that time, you know, I think LeBron was going down this path either way, but I, I hear what you're saying, and trust me, I have certainly have given it thought and wondered about, you know, my role. Or but you're older than LeBron. Huh? So, so you don't feel some form of acceptance to where, like, maybe you was influencing LeBron? Perhaps, but I'm just telling at that time, I had bought the narrative the media was spinning about Trayvon Martin, and I wasn't, I, I, a lot of stuff that the media does, Jim, blows my mind because I got to if Trayvon Martin when did that happen 2012 2013 I wasn't fully in tune with how corrupt and how dishonest the media was at that time Johnny Cochran told you oh wow that happened in 2012 I thought it was 10 yeah yeah 2012 I wasn't fully aware of how dishonest the media could be and how manipulative it could be at that time. And that's, I mean, trust me, I've always been a media critic, but I, I used to think like, well, the media's got some standards and they got editors and the media is, at that time, I didn't believe, I certainly believe it. The media really is the enemy of the people and wants to dismantle this country. I wasn't in that mindset then. And so I bought the Trayvon Martin story, uh, and and you know, certainly so regretted that. Are you saying Don was right? Are you saying Don Donald Trump was right? Fake news. <laughs> fake news. <laughs> Definitely fake news. Well, another thing that Delano said real quickly, and and this was amazing to me, and he he just says it so smoothly. He says, "We live in a society where we will kill the child, but save the killer." Save the rapist, yeah. yeah. Well, I was trying to just make yeah. it easy. But yeah, we'll kill the child, but save the rapist. Well, look at the stuff Roy said. I thought what Roy well, said. Well, I ain't got to Roy shit. <laughs> I, <laughs> I ain't got to Roy shit. Yeah, Roy's white. I, I don't know. I think Royce wants a job. <laughs> I, I think Royce wants to be part of the fearless army. Woo. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, Jay. I don't know what you trying to accomplish here. Uh, you get Delano, you get Rashad, you get Shamika, and if you add Royce, who the hell else you gonna add next? Aqib Tlaib? <laughs> Marvin Harrison? <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah. Uh, you got your squad there, boy. Yeah. Uh, Royce White brought the heat. It's like, I gotta really pay attention and and because that brother's deep. Eh, but I will say this. If, wait, when you talk to him now, if he wants to make it with the Army, he's going to have to work on one thing. He got to stop using all them big words. <laughs> okay? I mean, he got to stop using words like advantageously, uh, <laughs> neoliberal white women, and peripheralation of liberalization of white people. <laughs> now, he got to stop that now. Other than that, we're going to be all right. All right, uh, we're not going to do a pr approval rating. I want Antonio Brown. It's too, you know, at the, the Rittenhouse thing, it's not the right tone. All right, so uh, you guys go to youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock, leave a comment, hit that like button. This show should have 10,000 likes. No reason and, why it should. And on Apple, it should have a thousand five star reviews. I need them five star reviews right now. Jason, you give out five star reviews everywhere you eat. Why don't people give you five star <laughs> reviews? I first, ain't right is right, wrong is wrong, it ain't I, no in the middle. Bro. I agree. I hear tomorrow, uh, we'll see you uh, next week. I'm free.